Hello people of the internet, welcome back to my channel or welcome to my channel if you're new. So this case was actually suggested to me and brought to my attention by an old middle school friend, Taylor. So shout out to Taylor because without her you would not be hearing this story and I'm shook that not more people know about this or that this isn't a bigger thing because the story we're discussing today is the case of the tri-state crematorium in noble georgia also known as the largest mass desecration in american history before we get started i would just like to warn that this case was described as a stephen king novel so for this story we're going to time travel back to noble georgia in the mid 70s imagine the 16 anchor crematory that's owned by ray marsh this crematory provided ashes for not only georgia but alabama and tennessee and and the Chattanooga Times actually wrote a story about the crematorium claiming it to be one of the first minority owned crematoriums in the country. This alone made Marsh a well-respected person in his community. Noble Georgia is a very, very small town. So him having this crematory actually really helped the community at the time because this was a service that was hard to find. Cremation didn't become popular in the United States until the 80s. Its rise in popularity came from the acceptance that the church gave it. For example, the Catholic church had banned it, but finally they were chill about it in the 60s. Um, not only was it more accepted by the church, but cost and environment concerns also can be credited for its popularity. The Marsh family is running their shit. They are very prominent um, members of this community in Noble, Georgia. Not only does Ray Marsh run this crematory, he's also involved with local politics. He ran for coroner of Walker County and he lost by 100 votes or so. Ray was not the only member of the family making a name for it. His wife, Claire, was the first black chairman of Walker County Democratic Party. Fast forward to mid 90s, Ray ends up having a stroke with which debilitates him to a wheelchair. This leaves his son, Ray Brent Marsh, to take over the family business. Before taking on the family business, he actually had a promising football career at the University of Tennessee, which he was forced to give up to proceed to run the family business at 28 years old. Okay, we're hopping back in the time machine. We're fast forwarding to the year 2000. Bush is president, he survived Y2K. Venus Williams becomes the first black woman to win the women's single title. Brad Pitt was named people's sexiest man alive. And he married Jennifer Aniston. It was just, full blown and iconic year. Can we cheers to that alone? And while this phenomenal iconic stuff is happening, there is sinister stuff happening in Noble, Georgia. This brings us to the first incident. A gas fuel delivery man arrived on the property to provide service. During his time on the property, he saw things that were out of the ordinary. He saw that bodies were irresponsibly scattered across the yard. But when it was brought to Walker Sheriff County's department, they didn't find an issue with it and they straight up ignored it. They deemed this to be regulatory and not criminal. The reports on this story actually say he made two complaints and they again investigated and ignored it. Now this makes you wonder, could the police have investigated it and found something but because of who the Marsh family was and them being such a prominent member of the community, could they have just overlooked it. The Marsh family simply just existing and being the prominent community members that they are probably have connections. So I don't know, it's just like a small conspiracy theory. The second incident is a little bit over a year later in November 2001. The Environmental Protection Program of Atlanta, the EPA, received an anonymous tip that there were bodies in the tri-state crematory woods. The Walker County Sheriff Department was then again notified, but they said they conducted a routine check and they found nothing. Third incident was February 2002, approximately three months later. This is where a community member tipped off the EPA stating that while they were walking their dog, they uncovered a human bone on the property surrounding the vicinity of the tri-state crematory. The EPA agents arrive on the scene and end up finding a skull and some more scattered body parts all over the woods. This then prompted the police to arrive on February 15th, 2002, the day after Valentine's Day. How romantic. Again, I would like to warn if you don't have the stomach for listening to this type of stuff, click away, I have other videos. But if you do like true crime and you're dark like me, stick around, we're about to list everything they found. I would like to remind you this case is described as a Stephen King novel. This is why. 339 uncremated bodies scattered everywhere and because of the large amounts of remains found, they declared a state of emergency. Only 226 bodies could be identified by DNA, which means more than 100 victims went unidentified. The New York Times claimed that every funeral director for 100 miles did business with a tri-state crematory. So imagine this guys, you're on the property. Corpses are literally lying everywhere. In the woods, in the sheds, in the coffins, in the bushes, stacked up, in vaults. But the most important thing to take note of is that the bodies are rotting. Some of these corpses were still dressed up. Others were still found in hospital gowns. Inside amongst the corpses, they also found the skeleton of a baby. So these corpses ranged in ages. Remember guys, he was one of the main crematory businesses for three states. Apparently 
apparently there was a body just halfway in the incinerator with tons stacked around it. It's hell on earth, to put it simply. A mobile morgue was shipped all the way from Maryland to Georgia to help identify the bodies and deal with the massive amount of corpses they had. They help fingerprint photograph and other forensic tasks on the bodies um, quickly and efficiently. And given that they were dealing with a massive amount of corpses on the property, they needed ample resources to help them. With this, with all the massive corpses around the land, you're probably wondering, what are the families receiving if they're not getting their actual family members' ashes? Wood ash, concrete dust, and bone dust were commonly used by Marsh as replacements for human remains. For those who received real human ashes, it's hard to determine whether or not they received the correct person. And for some people, when they saw the ashes, they recognized immediately that it wasn't their loved one. For example, in 2002, Helen McKean's ashes were scattered by her daughter after an unfortunate passing due to Parkinson's, and they found painted fingernails and three dental crowns along with it. Miss McKean never wore nail polish, and nor did she have dental crowns. Could you imagine, could you imagine getting your loved one's ashes and seeing this and knowing like, oh, wait a minute. This isn't right. Another person thought she was receiving her dear mother, Norma, in an urn, but it was actually wood shavings and cement. Though this next story is really sad, it had a lot of information, so I'm still going to share it. According to A Long Day at the End of the World, a memoir written by Brent Hendricks, the son of one of the victims, a majority of the bodies were found in eight big burial pits filled with bodies, trash, and even a pool table. So his father had passed away, and they actually had an official burial and funeral for him, but, but because of his mom's burial phobia. The fear of him being eaten by maggots and worms led her to exhume the body. This happened in 1997, the year I was born, and they happened to send the body to Tri-State Crematory. Claimed that his mother having her husband's ashes with her brought her comfort. However, the body of Hendrick's father was found in a coffin in the woods behind the main crematory building. According to his son, he was still wearing his custom-made cowboy boots with his name written on one heel. Before I go on, I want to hit the topic of Georgia and the weather. Georgia is hot. Corp Corpses, rotting corpses, and southern heat do not go together. Here's a list why. There's different stages of decomposition. There's fresh audiolysis. I'm not even sure if I'm pronouncing that right. Bloat, active decay, advanced decay, and dry skeletal remains. We know these things because of one science and another thing called corpse farms. Yes, this is a real thing. Corpse farms allow us to understand the environmental effects on decomposition. So let's think about Georgia. The average high temperatures are in the warm 78 degrees to 87, if not hotter because you know, global warming's happening now. And the average low temps are between 60 61 to 71 Fahrenheit. So with this weather, it's not like we're keeping the bodies fresh. Cause think about it, cause in morgues, they keep bodies at a cold, nice temperature. With heat, this kind of encourages the breakdown of organic materials and bacteria. Bacteria also grows faster in warmer climates. So what this all means, the bodies were gross. One of the articles that I found described the liquefied remains of the corpuses essentially surrounding them like a puddle. One of the emergency workers who previously worked in the rubble of the World Trade Center stated, I've never, never, never seen anything like this. One FBI agent threw up on site and reportedly stated to the Telegraph that the scene looked like a Stephen King novel. That's where that quote came from. It stinks like hell down there, decaying flesh, bits of bone. You can't walk without stepping on bodies. I can see their faces every night when I close my eyes, dot, dot, dot. The undergrowth is so thick, we have to hack it back. What's underneath is like a battlefield, like the remains of several bloody massacres all years apart. Ray Marsh was immediately arrested. He was charged with 787 criminal accounts. This included theft by deception, abusing a corpse, fraud relating to the burial services, and fraud pertaining to false statements. He pleaded guilty to 12 years, only 12 years in prison. During his time in prison, he apparently joined a seminary and earned his bachelor's, master's, and PhD in religion. <laughs> he got out in 2020's current contender and worst year ever, 2016. In March 2002, authorities discovered pictures of decomposing corpses on Ray Brent Marsh's office computer, according to prosecutor Buzz Franklin. But Franklin never said anything as to why they were there. Some bodies were dumped on the property predating when Ray Brent Marsh fully took over the crematory. Rusted coffins were also found on the property, so they appear to have been dug up. And with all this stuff being weird and questionable, I'm not sure why it wasn't looked into more, but it's beyond me. A big question that never gets answered in this case is why? Think about it. Wouldn't it be easier to actually do your job and cremate the bodies instead of spreading them over and across your 60 acre property? I just, my brain isn't, 
I'm not comprehending something. But between the time that Ray took over and the time of the investigation, over 2,000, 2,000, 2,000, 2,000 bodies had been sent to him. The reasons as to why someone would do this are limited because it's crazy. So Ray Marsh had initially claimed that the incinerator wasn't working, but that was found untrue. Another theory is that he was just really f***ing lazy, but that doesn't make sense either because as I said earlier, you couldn't be lazy to spread out those bodies like that. Now answering how this happened is a lot easier to answer. According to one of the local sources covering this story at the time in 1994, Tommy Marsh had apparently asked his politician friend to keep his inspectors out of the crematorium through a loophole in Georgia's state law. Law. He had at one point been involved in local politics running for coroner of Walker County. He lost, again, remember, by 100 votes. But it wouldn't be surprising if he still had connection to powerful people in the community. Basically, the tri-state crematory only dealt with funeral homes, and with a loophole in Georgia's state law at the time, this meant that they could operate without a license. And this also meant that they could operate without a yearly inspection, so it's easy to, I guess, get away with this. So the aftermath was five years after his arrest, Marsh's legal team made him undergo a lot of different psychological and physical testing. And they actually discovered from toxology reports that he was suffering from mercury poisoning. He would most likely got this from cremating bodies with dental fillings, which wouldn't normally be a big deal unless you don't have proper ventilation, which of course, not surprisingly, he did not have. So Ray Brent Marsh suffered from what we call Mad Hatter's disease. Erythism exhibits a lot of behavioral changes such as irritability, low self-confidence, depression, apathy, shyness, avoidance. However, in some extreme cases, with prolonged exposure to mercury vapors, personality changes and memory loss can occur. Ray Marsh's only answer to the families that entrusted him was, to those of you who may have come here today looking for answers, I cannot give you. After his release, it was part of his probation to write an apology letter, excuse me, handwrite an apology letter to a designated representative for each of the identified remains. So there was around 320 plus letters that he had to write. Marsh also had to handwrite an apology to the public and the community. This apology was shared amongst many different media outlets. To my community. I humbly and very respectfully acknowledge the hurt and gain my actions have caused. I sincerely apologize. Moving forward, I can assure everyone that my life and deeds will not only prove the sincerity of my words. I'm thankful to so many who have welcomed me home, wished me well, prayed for me, and are giving me an opportunity to return to my family in this community. Prayerfully, Brent Marsh. His probation involves him paying a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of money to the state of Georgia. And he is on probation for 75 years. Of the 16 acres, there was $80 million settlement that eventually led to 1.5 acres being put in a trust. This is so that the land remains untouched and it can be served as a memorial for the victims. The community had a mixed response. Like one victim stated that he served his time and that, hey, some people get less for murder. Other victims stated that their family members were never found and thus Marsh should never see the light of day. However, 11 days after his release, he was preaching a sermon in church. He briefly addressed things only by saying basically, oh, well, you know where I've been which is obviously referring to jail. This event was later turned into a movie. I'm going to put the title of the movie down here because I don't want to butcher its name, but this is a Cherokee word that means Blue Hills for God. It's really kind of creepy and it was filmed in the area with the locals. The director claims that he first was like, what does this say about my hometown? But ultimately he stated, at first I was very angry, but the more I dug into it, the more I saw this as a story of hope and forgiveness. This movie basically just portrays Ray Brent Marsh as pretty much a zombie, aloof and soft-spoken guy. I don't really know if this movie was aiming to take such a sympathetic tone on Marsh's case. The last thing I want to focus on is corpse farms. These are properties with, however, many donated bodies rotting in a field or wherever research facilities want to do studies on decompositions in different conditions. I'm not saying that what Ray Brent Marsh was doing is that. It's also not supposed to come off as a conspiracy theory. It's just a very odd coincidence. Corpse farms have been extremely useful in filling in the gaps of knowledge and they exist in very different research facilities across the United States. The largest one is in Texas, which is 26 acres. Another thing to think about is that prosecutor Buzz Franklin claimed that the photos of decomposing bodies were found on his office computer. Additionally, there were multiple sources claiming that some bodies were actually put there before 1996 when Ray Brent Marsh took over. Was this man actually into this? 
this and doing it because he liked it or was it because of the mercury poisoning or was it a sinister experiment i just want to know why and if i could get in contact with him and just interview him i would love that because the public needs answers sir not much makes sense in this case and Brent's motives are very unclear. Regardless of any of that, I cannot fathom what the families went through. To lose your loved one and find a comfort in having them in a way, only to find out that your loved one was actually not in there. One thing I can say I'm happy about is that this guy is on probation for the rest of his life and not only that but he's legally prohibited from profiting off of this story. Again shout out to Taylor for telling me about this case. If you guys have any more suggestions leave comments down below. Feel free to DM me whatever. Make sure to like, comment, subscribe, all that jazz. That's all I have for you guys today so namaste. Have a nice day guys.